Okay, hello everyone. I am Callie Hanna here from Fandom Wire to talk with a very special guest today. She is an acclaimed writer in comics, animation, and a few other different mediums um, who's worked uh, with a lot of uh, iconic characters in the uh, the DC universe and other various franchises. Please welcome uh, Megan Fitzmartin. Megan, thank you so much for being here today. Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, well, thank you so much. Glad to hear that. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm a, I'm a little nervous. This is the first time I've ever like done something like this before, but you know, to just sort of get into the thick of things as mm -hmm. it were, I would say probably your most well-known story, at least of what you've done recently, is the the Tim Drake stuff. You know, you yeah. obviously wrote the story where um, he came out as bisexual and, you know, he got a, a boyfriend, Bernard. Um, very sweet, very wholesome. And I sort of wanted to talk about what was kind of the the impetus of that story. Like what what inspired you to write it and, you know, tell that specific story in that specific way. So with that specific story, I was approached by my editor, Dave Wilgas, who is brilliant and wonderful and has done some really amazing stuff. He's nominated for an Eisner right now. Oh. I'm very proud. Congrats um, to yeah. yeah. Uh, he approached me when he was working on Batman Urban Legends, and I had previously worked on uh, a Tim Drake story for Future State. And he was like, you did a really fun job on that. Would you like to continue working with Tim Drake? Uh, and I loved him and was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, so he he gave me some time to think about it. Like, what story would you want to tell with Tim? And the way that I approach that story is the way that I approach any character that I work with uh, when it comes to franchise characters. To to use your your word is like looking at their stories and seeing what feels untapped and unexplored. Mm -hmm. um, I had read a lot of Tim Drake stuff before, so I went back and read some of my faves and I was really struck by this, this question of identity that Tim sort of has perpetually had. Like he, he stumbled onto the mantle of Robin in the way that like he he chose it because he chose it for Batman's purpose, not necessarily for his. He chose yeah. to like work in those spaces because he felt that that was the needs for other people. If I oh. if I recall correctly, the famous quote like t like is like Batman needs a Robin. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, he, it's not that I want to be Robin, it's that Batman needs a Robin. So I will do that. He has always been a character who is sacrificed. And oftentimes that sacrifices his own identity. So I wanted to dive in a little bit on the question of identity. And the more that I was looking at the story of Tim, the more I was recognizing um, this, this question of interest that he has um he is very clearly in love with stephanie and i think that that is a very true and real thing but also there is some sort of i i always explain it as like a piece of the puzzle that i always felt missing for tim um that didn't fully explain that piece of his identity and so as i was rereading my comics i reached out to my editor and was like hey I think this is the story and you're going to have to tell me now if I can't do it because I am already like I'm full full steam ahead in this direction. So um yeah, we we, we chatted a little bit about it. I I had a PowerPoint and uh yeah, he was he, my editor was on board and we we moved ahead with the uh, with the story. Well, that's that is yeah, that I think that makes a lot of sense and I was sort of following in on that, you know, you mentioned, you know, chatting with your editor of, hey, is this a thing I can do? Um, so I was just sort of wondering what kind of, with that, what was the process of sort of collaborating with editors and I think with DC in general about that story? Because again, this is, you know, a very, you know, well-storied character and someone who is, you know, part of probably their biggest franchise, whether we like it or not, um, is like, hey, yo, he's by now. How, 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 how was that process and how did you go about 
telling them, hey, this is fine, actually. <laughs> I mean, DC was very on board with it. it. Like, DC comes from a space, as did my editor, of as long as this is a character motivation, fine. And because this is a character okay. that has such a history of it, like, I very much came in going, I'm not trying to say that, like, I'm not trying to rewrite the history of this character. Right, I'm right, trying of course. to contextualize the history of this character, which okay. um, everybody was very supportive and on board for. So that's that's good. That is always good to hear. Yeah. You know, it's it's you know, I think especially and one of the other things I want to talk about is you know, especially in this particular you know sort of climate we're in, where there's some uh, people, let's say. Um, that, you know, maybe are, you know, not as supportive or understanding. I'm trying to be very generous and friendly yeah. to potential yeah. YouTube uploading in my wording here. Um, but, you know, people who, you know, how do you, and, you know, I, if I remember correctly, I think it even says on your, like, website that you make a note of yourself to be a champion for queer and neurodivergent um, uh, characters and individuals and as a um as an autistic trans lesbian I'm like yo it me <laughs> um, and I guess I was wondering how do you go about you know balancing that and sort of keeping morale up and you know working to champion those kind of stories amidst you know whatever backlash you may receive so part of the backlash that you're talking about comes from a specific community that I have grown up in, which is uh, generally the Christian community, the religious community. Um, I went to school to be a youth pastor. Uh, my background wow. is in church ministries. I uh, went to Israel to study. Um, you know, I, I have a whole uh, history within that. And the thing that I learned from that, my faith is still important to me, and the piece of my faith that I have always championed is love. That has been the oh. cornerstone of who I am and what I believe in, and uh, that is what keeps me going, to tell stories to people, to show that they are loved, that they belong, and everybody belongs. Everyone deserves to be in this world, to have their stories told, and um so I have no uh, fear whenever it comes to certain communities within that who disagree because they're wrong. I have studied this. This is uh, what I know. I can speak against everything that they provide, mostly because I've read the Bible more times than they have. <laughs> and uh, so I think that that's where a large part of both my morality and my purpose, or my, my uh, not morality, but my, my motivation and my purpose comes from um, is in showing love, showing the love that I believe exists. That was, that was very beautiful. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm tearing up a little bit. That was, <laughs> that's, that is very beautiful and very poignant. I, I, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, Peaceless. Uh, nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, hold on. I actually need some water as well. Bless you for thinking this is water. It's seven o'clock where I am, so that's oh okay, yeah. I'm that just, I'm, it's not water. <laughs> that makes okay. <laughs> that yeah. makes a little more sense. <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, moving on. So your other big project that was more recent, um, I think just came out a couple months ago. I think at the time is the uh, Justice League Cross Ruby Superheroes and Huntsmen Part One. Nailed it. Um, Nailed it. <laughs> I was worried with how many words were in that title. It's that a I was long listen. It is a long. It, whenever, whenever I started writing, one of the, the main things was imagine it on the marquee. And this would, I think, break the marquee. It I just feel like they'd have to, I, I feel like I've seen like an illustration somewhere of just like, you know, the guy on the ladder who has to like put in like an Keep extended it, like yeah. little side to the letters. It's, it's that. Um, yes. It's that. Correct. And I think when I was uh, when I was watching the movie, I when I when I sat down to watch the movie, I was really worried that I was not going to understand any of it because I have not seen Ruby. Um, and um, I walked away from it thinking, okay, there's definitely stuff in here that I'm supposed to get be from the show that I just don't. But sure. overall, I was actually really surprised. Like, okay, 
I get who these people are. I get what their right. deal is. I get what their relationships are supposed to be. You know, I, I get why they'd be doing what they're doing, at, you know, in which is something that surprised me in the case of at least the, you know, the Ruby side, because obviously the Justice League side, you know, I'm a, I'm a big DC person. I know, I know those people. Um, those but, are fine. That's yeah, right. I get what that's supposed to be. It's these other people. Um, yeah. uh, so I guess I was wondering, was that sort of a conscious mentality when you were writing in terms of accessibility to newcomers versus, you know, hey, people who are going to watch this are like longtime fans. I want to satisfy that. Like, how did you how did you go about balancing that? Uh, I mean, look, we knew going into it that there would be folks that have not seen Ruby. And that's fine. I hadn't seen Ruby before I started working on the project. And then my, my producer came to me, Jim Craig, who is the best and amazing. I worked with him on Justice Society World War II. And he came to me and was like, have you seen Ruby? And I said, give me two weeks and I will know everything <laughs> about Ruby. Um, and so I benched the whole thing over Christmas. It was during uh, December, 2020. So I wasn't doing much anyway. Yeah. And fell in love with the show, which is what I knew would happen because I did know enough about Ruby to be like, I know that I will love this. And I just, I need to not make this my whole personality right now. I can do this <laughs> later, but like, I just don't have the time. And so now when, when Warner Brothers came to me, I was like, yeah, sure. Now's the time. Now's a great time. Um, but yeah, when we were talking about it and I, I worked with the DC team, Warner Brothers team and the Rooster Teeth team, and we, we all were aware that like the, probably the thing that we, we need to make sure that, that people know of is the, the Ruby backstory, the Ruby world. Um, and so we had a fair amount of conversation, like also wanting to give, there's certain elements. And the reason why I, I wrote the story the way that I did is because I think Ruby is a really beautiful story, a really interesting and fun story. And they do some great stuff throughout the seasons that I really wanted to have in the movie because it's just emotionally resonant. And so I wanted to have those pieces. I basically wanted to have my cake and eat it too, where I wanted to have those pieces while still being able to introduce new viewers to this really cool world that I have very much enjoyed being a part of. Um, so it was not as hard as you think that it would be to be yeah. honest because it was just a labor of love in that way oh that's I mean that is definitely a very um interesting approach and I you know you said you have your, have your cake and eat it too and you know as someone who watched it and enjoyed the movie it, it kind of worked um I will say <laughs> yes. I I have not at time I haven't really been able to sit down and actually watch Ruby yet because just yeah life there's um, a lot of content in the world too to be honest there's so many like, there's just so much stuff my watch uh, list yeah, is un, unbearably huge um but uh I, it definitely made me want to seek out the show more than yes. I I had you know prior to to watching the film and I guess my other curiosity on that is I was curious as to how sort of like the lineup was chosen because you know you obviously have on both sides you have characters you obviously want like the, Ruby the main four, like right. Ruby, Weiss, Yang, Blake, nailed it. <laughs> uh, Weiss, like, but yes, you did Weiss, it. sorry, Weiss. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so like you have the main four of, the, of, of that team that you right. want to get in on the DC side. Obviously people like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, you'd yes. want to include, but then you have people like, like I personally really like Vixen, but I'm like, that's not a character I would typically associate as like a league member or like, I'm not sure what the importance level of any particular side characters on the, you know, Ruby side of things generally is. So I was kind of curious of what the thought process was of choosing like who you wanted to, to be in it and really highlight. Part of it is, um, it's a twofold part. One is making sure that everybody's on equal footing. This is also why I wanted to, I, I came in immediately with a pitch of, hey, what if we de-age the Justice League? Um, and the reason that I did that was because I wanted everybody to be on an equal playing field of uh, having a fun time being teenagers. Um, we don't get to see the Justice League as teenagers all that much, which is a, a crying shame because I think it's very fun. Yeah, I think I was, 
Okay, this is a bit this is a bit of a weird uh, question, I will admit on a side note. So I noticed uh, I, I looked over your website when I was prepping for this. Um, and I noticed that one of your inspirations is uh, the old Justly cartoon, which is a yes. favorite of mine as well. And yes. I remember specifically, I forget whether it's in the original run or unlimited, but there is an episode. It's of unlimited. That show. It's, it's yeah. episode two or three. Uh, it's by Hank Gilroy. I love it very much. Yes, this was the motivation and the inspiration for this particular. On, <laughs> so on the, on the DVD, because I told everybody at DC and Warner Brothers this. I was like, no, this is what I'm pulling from because I had a great time. If they're eight years old, it's so funny. Um, <laughs> I on on the DVD that episode is one of the bonus features which I'm very ah, okay good so in, in stores now um, yes, right. <laughs> shameless plug <laughs> uh, but yeah so that yeah no that's a hundred percent I'm not coy about it that absolutely is where that came from I okay, love it good because I, I thought am I crazy or no, is this like <laughs> no that was that was part of the pitch um, but, but what worked about this was that it puts them on equal playing field with the teenage heroes of Ruby. Um, and then the other side of it was the, the conversation of, uh, how do we introduce people who are coming to this for the Justice League with the Ruby characters? And so that was another reason why, uh, the characters of the Justice League were chosen, um, so that I could tell specific different types of stories that would help us introduce the characters to each other as well as the audience to these characters. You know, that actually, you know, thinking back on the movie, that makes a lot of sense because I remember, because I know Jessica Cruz has like a whole subplot of dealing with her anxiety, which is mirrored with the blonde kid whose name escapes me. Um, Lon. Lon, right. John. 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 Think, okay. Uh, it, yes. it's he's a he's a Jane a Joan of Arc so think Joan of Arc ah okay okay yeah. okay that makes sense now yeah um uh yeah no exactly like wanting I it's one of the the pieces of Jessica's story I she's I think my favorite if not one of my favorite uh she's either the top Green Lantern or want like the top two I, I mean I, it's like between her and like John Stewart probably for me yeah I mean like, it is it's between her and John Stewart I do like Kyle Rayner a lot yeah Kyle Rayner like, is cool and Hal is also there he's fine Hal is, <laughs> there too. Hal is fine uh, I like Hal he's just the most boring choice I just I I had a very interesting I had a boyfriend who absolutely loved Hal Jordan and I was like this is this explains a lot about your personality. <laughs> I, I don't know if we should keep dating. I'm just oh not. Oh my <laughs> God. Um. Um, but uh, I think Jessica has such interesting story fodder. And I think she's just, she's a fantastic character. I love her so much and want her to be used more. And so uh, bringing her in and pairing her with the character, John, who has gone through a lot of trauma in the series. Um, felt like a very good story sim uh symbiotic uh symmetry 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 symbiosis. symbiosis yes something yeah. that starts with the letter s um, symmetry all of that yeah <laughs> all right um well all right let me see uh so one of the other things i wanted to ask you in relation to that is obviously with something like just league cross ruby you're dealing with a lot of, of of people, as we mentioned, there's like seven main characters on each side. And yes. I was sort of wondering, you know, obviously it's a very large ensemble. So I was wondering, uh, how do you, like, how does your writing process kind of differ when you're writing for like a large ensemble versus say something like, something like Robin, where it's generally like one main character and a few supporting players, like, how do you balance that? And do you have like, do you have a preference? Um, I mean, I think both make me want to throw myself into, into the, excuse me, both make me want to throw myself into the ocean pretty <laughs> equally. Um, I think there's, there's positives and negatives to both. Um, there were, I can't stress this enough. There were so many characters specifically for an 80 uh, minute film. Uh, 14 characters for an 80 minute film is uh 
a lot. <laughs> a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I did my darndest on making sure that everyone has a moment. Um, but on the other side, that like really simplifies your story. Like because you don't have a lot of time, it is bare bones basic for each character. You get one, two, three moments. That's it. We're in, we're out, and the movie is done. Um, <laughs> So there's there's a simplicity to having that many characters, which I find really interesting. Um, and, ter- and like also, I think it's different different mediums. So like to your point, I do write in different mediums and I love writing in different mediums. Um, and I think that I have always enjoyed watching the different mediums exist uh, on screen as, uh, as teams, because I love dynamics. Ultimately what I love uh, our dynamics. I love character and dynamics and seeing how different characters and choices will affect other characters and, and how they feel about each other. And so whenever it comes to comics, I tend to lean more towards uh, either like either a solo character like Tim or a smaller group. Uh, growing up, my favorite comic uh, is and still like was and is to this day still the Fantastic Four um, because that is all about dynamics and it's all about character relationships and so I think no matter what format you're writing be it comics or animation or tv or audio um, it starts with character and it starts with those character dynamics so it, it, it's not really any different if I'm writing a billion characters or one character because it is all about how those characters will interact with the world. I see. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. All right. I also uh, another thing I want to talk about was sort of writing as a collaborative process because a lot of people a lot of people tend to think writing is just like someone just sort of sits in a chair, goes boop to boop to boop, done and. When in reality, like even even someone like me is just writing, you know, you know, editorials for a for you know a, a fandom website like this. Um, does, you know, that's obviously still there also is writing and important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like it, like even in that context, there is a certain level of collaboration involved. So I was wondering, you know, obviously, you know, when you're writing for comics, you are working directly with an artist who's going to, you know, obviously visualize it for something like Just Society World War II. You had a co-writer you were working with. So how do you go about? Uh, the collaboration process. I love collaboration. I love it. I I love notes. Um, I love good notes, to be clear. But I love <laughs> notes um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, if they are good notes, they are coming from a space of we all want this to. We all want to work together. We all want this project to be really good, um, and so. Yeah, I just I have the best time and I prefer it because I like I as much as I love being the solo voice and face of things, I don't I don't like being in front of cameras. <laughs> I do it, but I like I'm I'm a writer on purpose. But like I will I will be the the front facing person for things. I am nothing without everybody that I work with, from editors to artists to letterers to colorists to the animators to directors like I my vision is only so limited and that's what's so cool about writing and about storytelling is that we get to all work together and bring our really cool visions and thoughts to a project that at the end of the day it's not what I like I've had people ask me oh, well, is it what you imagined it would be? No, it never is. That's great. <laughs> I never want it to be what I imagine it to be because my imagination is so limited to just my knowledge and where I've existed in the world. So the the joy is having other people's input and, and the way that they, they fix up like my silly letters and words. So yeah. I think that, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. Like I personally, like I'm, um, you know, I'm kind of an aspiring actor in addition to this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I majored in theater in college. And I think one of the things I've always loved about doing theater is, you know, you're, 
you're just this sort of one small, like even though, you know, yeah. like your role kind of feels like the whole universe. And when you think about it, it can be its own kind of universe in and of itself, but it's also like one small piece of this larger puzzle. And that's always been really fascinating and then very satisfying to me as a, as a creative and as an actor, or as a writer or as, or as whatever, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the, the way that, so I'm, uh, I split time between LA and London and we talk a lot about like the London theater scene specifically and how production managers are, uh, or production designers, excuse me, are like, at second billing now because of the amazing brilliant things that they can do on stage and like if I were writing a play I would never think about any of that like I wouldn't I wouldn't have any idea because that's not my skill set like that's just not where I come from and so you know I need I, I I've got some amazing artists that I worked with on Tim, uh, Riley Rosma who's gr great and brilliant and Serge and Nicola um, I have had on Belen, who who did the Batman Urban Legends with me, Belen is uh, half the reason people love that story is because of Belen's art. Like it's just astounding. Um, and then on other spaces, like I have worked working with Jeremy, working I worked on a show called Supernatural, working in the writers' rooms, working with the actors on that. The the crew we had that crew since day one, and they were were brilliant humans who had like who loved the show and had like care about the show and like that is that's the joy the joy is to work together with your friends to make cool stuff and and what a how lucky are we that we get to do that exactly yeah I feel like a lot of people I think especially um think of writers and directors um or writers slash directors or what have you as people would be like I have this specific vision you know yeah. like a lot of people are defined by that you know art art auteur theory yeah. mindset yeah. of like I have laid out this exact specific vision in my mindscape and everything must be you know executed to the exact letter in this way and 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. and I feel like in reality what it comes down to is you know you you are creating you know your piece of you know a, a cohesive whole and part of the joy at least in my mind is is that, you know, working with others and finding, you know, the, uh, you know, the whole new sides of it that you may never even have, have conceived of, you know, in, I, I, within your own little bubble. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to be an auteur. Like that has no interest in, in my artistic style or vision. Like, I don't want to be an auteur. I want to always work with people and I want to work with people who are better than me and like have more vision than I do, because that, that, create some powerful stuff yeah I think and you know I think that's a very good mindset to have in terms of you know you know just you know being able to to work with other people and just finding finding the joy in, in that um I guess sort of on on a similar note uh you've obviously as we've mentioned you've worked with a, a lot of DC stuff you know Robin Justice League Justice Society um and you know you you worked on Supernatural um I probably will not be asking any questions about that because I have not seen Supernatural and I am not prepared to deal that with is. the fan base um That's <laughs> fine. And, yeah um but I guess I just wanted to ask you know you obviously you know you haven't worked only with franchises you've done a lot of scripted audio dramas you know of your you know that are based entirely on your creations, you know, you created Red Rhino and a few other projects. And I guess I wanted to ask what tends to, what do you notice that about, you know, writing within a pre-existing franchise versus, you know, writing for, you know, an original property where you're, you know, you're creating everything whole cloth. Hmm. I think, I think it's easier to write for uh, properties that aren't mine. Like there's hmm. less, pressure because there's so much history with a character that oh. I I know where they're coming from I know the history behind them um there is it's like, it's like having training wheels I think working with a lot of uh a lot of properties that that are in IP right now it's it's great but it's it is 
you know what this is either like and I, I I will come in on different stuff and I'll say this is my pitch but this is the like this is the thing that I'm going to do because this is what this character is um versus writing my own stuff is scarier it's so much scarier it's the there are so many options there's less options for characters that have are pre-existing but for mine they can go in any direction and that's scary hmm. yeah I mean that's definitely uh, I you know, I hadn't really thought about that approach, but I can definitely see why, because most most people I think tend to think the opposite is true because it's like, yeah. you know, when you're working with a pre-established character, you know, there's so much expectation and so much, you know, history. People are like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Whereas opposed to, you know, if you're making your own stuff, like, yeah, nobody, you know, this is, <laughs> nobody has any pre-built expectations. So I can just do it a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it, uh, it's why, I I grew up in a time where fan fiction was really big. Like it's it's still fan, really big, but like nobody talked about it uh, when I was growing up. And the thing that now people have been talking about fan fiction as being a really good place to grow as a writer because you don't have to create some of the hardest stuff for writers is creating world and creating characters that that people will be invested in right off the bat. And when you are starting with writing with fanfic, you learn how to lean into those characters. You learn how to, like you, you it, this is why I call it training wheels. You do a lot of the bare bones basics of writing and, and how to structure story and how to plot and how to tell these character stories without having to do, I think some of the harder stuff, which is building the world and building whole new characters so uh yeah I think that that's where a lot of that comes from yeah I yeah that definitely makes a lot of sense and I would I would agree because I've seen a lot more come around to the idea of you know fan fiction you know as you in, in your words training wheels as a as a training tool and yeah. you know I'm not really a narrative writer at this point in my in my life but I okay. I would I would 100% agree with that assessment because like when I took creative writing in college, you know, I think one of the assignments was just like, we, we had, we would have like free writing assignments. And for a lot of those, especially later on, later on I would just write fan fiction because yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's easier. You know, I, I worked with pre-established characters. So I just, I wrote a, a Steven Universe fan fiction that I never, I never actually finished because Single Pale Rose completely debunked what I was trying to do because it can't, I started writing that before that episode aired. It's, I find it really, really funny, the circumstances with which that turned out. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would, agree with that. So on, on a similar note, um, as a writer, um, and as someone, you know, who's worked with a lot of, you know, different franchises and with different people, you know, you've talked about a lot of the different artists you've, you've worked with that you, you've enjoyed that process. Do you have any like dream projects in terms of either like a character or a franchise or like a collaborative partner that you'd be like, if you could, you would do like whatever it takes to, you know, get th that particular project. Oh yes, I mean, hands down, Fantastic Four. But I, right. I would love nothing more than to be able to tell a Fantastic Four story. I'd have to like, I'd have to schedule some time to cry about it because I would just, <laughs> get on, but I love them so much. Um, so that's one of them. Terry Matlis is a is a writer who I have long loved and would love to work with. Um, I just think he is brilliant. He did uh, Twelve Monkeys and uh, just finished up on Picard. Uh, mm -hmm and does such a really good job of, of telling really beautiful, emotional character-driven stories within uh, the, the world in which we already know. So like, you know, he came to 12 Monkeys that was already a film. And so he adapted it into his own thing. And it's a really beautiful thing. Picard, the same thing. Like the last season of Picard is just gorgeous. and. So that would be somebody else that I would love to work with. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those two very, very specific things uh, would I would love nothing more than to do uh, do some work in that. All right. That's, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a very good answer. And I guess I'm, you know, just out of uh, curiosity. Is there, is there anything you could say about like 
if you were to get a Fantastic Four story, like what what would you want to tell? Or? I mean, it's a Reed Richards story for mm. sure. Like I, I feel very strongly about Reed Richards. Um, he is an incredibly empathetic character who often people don't realize is an empathetic character. Most people are like, oh, he's so heartless. And it's like, no, 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 no. Well, that's he's- because they read the Ultimate Comics. <laughs> well, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me about Ultimate Comics. I refuse. I, I re- know. I refuse. know. <laughs> I like, I haven't read Ultimate Spider-Man, which by all accounts is very good. But like, I couldn't get over how dirty they did the Fantastic Four. I was like, okay. I to read any right. Ultimate that is fair because honestly, having I've I've read a lot of Ultimate Spider-Man and I've read snippets of some of the other Ultimate things. Ultimate Spider-Man is genuinely like the only good one. <laughs> like it's, I, mean, it's, I have heard that. That I one's did. really good, and the rest is like garbage. <laughs> it's so bad. Well, like it was coming out when it was coming out at the same time. I was like, I refuse. I'm so mad about. It. I could probably go back now and read it, but like at the time I was so I was just I like I still think about that going what the only thing that has been more egregious to me um was the uh Fantastic Four uh the more recent Fantastic Four movie uh, with Fan Four Stick yes um Miles Teller I was like this is you so so Sue doesn't even get to go to the negative zone that's true but they bring the guy named Victor Von Doom and great, great. that's totally fine <laughs> that's fine also she makes their costumes i just everything about that movie i was like who who did this to me specifically Ma- Ma- I, I every time i think about that and honestly basically any fantastic four movie not named the incredibles um i'm like <laughs> dear, yeah. d- dear god marvel studios matt shackman please please save us <laughs> i know i know i know i'm I'm hopeful, I'm although I, I refuse. I refuse to to allow that any movie that I don't write about Fantastic Four is good. Although it will probably be good. I mean, you know, like Ke- Kevin Feige, give this woman a call. Like, there's I um, just, yeah. Um, I've got. I've thought about it a lot. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Ah, well, that is a uh, that is very good to know. Um, and speaking of things that I, uh, I don't know if you can actually, uh, say, but, uh, people, people will get on my case if I don't at least try. Um, uh, you know, obviously we were talking about Justice League Cross Ruby earlier, and that movie is of course a part one. Is there anything you could say about part two? Like, (laughs) oh, I can't. Other well, than <laughs> other than a part two exists, that's it. That's all. That's all that anyone can say. Okay, I'm uh, all right. Well, well, there, there you have it. Internet, I tried. Um, <laughs> certainly did. Well done. I made an attempt, and I guess to um. So we've covered a lot of the stuff I really want to talk about. I, I'm really, I really enjoyed our conversation. You've, you know, you're a very insightful and. Uh, from all accounts, very kind and sweet person. Um, it's been a pleasure. I do want to ask, and this is admittedly somewhat of a more uh, question that pertains to me. I don't know how much of our audience is actually going to care about this, but I've just written, I took a few notes of things I wanted to ask you. And yes. at the bottom of my notes here, it just reads, Red Rhino season to be when question mark, because I, I binged the entire series. Oh, bless you. Days, and I got really invested. And then it ends and Wes is just like, I'm back. And I'm like, where did he go? Where did he go? What was he doing? Why didn't he tell anybody? Yes, good. Yes, that is what we want. So, I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about it. And I actually, uh, the reason that we... B has taken so long to come about is uh, COVID came up. I was so kind now, of, I, I had a, I had a thought because yeah. because it says, because you say in the end of that episode, it returns January, 2020. And I was like, so was this the so, plague? Was this the, right. was this the plague's fault? I feel this like was, this was the plague's fault. This was the plague's fault. Yeah. A hundred percent. This was the plague's fault. Um, and then ever like out during the plague, uh some folks moved around so it's been uh, having to get everybody back is going to be its its own uh sort of struggle but i i'm so pleased that you're excited about it i have been 
uh, working on it. So, you know, keep an eye out. It's not dead. That's all that I want. That to is me. that is very nice to know because I I have gotten too invested in way too many things that, that end love- on cliffhangers. Blair's sideways at Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, I'm still not yeah, over no, that. Very fair. Oh, God. No, uh, my, my goal is it, it is not dead. It's only sleeping. It's only okay. red. Okay. Good. That is... That is good to know. I honestly did not think anything would come of that question. <laughs> I'm delighted. I'm so delighted. I was just like, I'm just going to stick this out here and just, I'm, I'm, there should be, I'm going to at least try. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 well, that is. Made my night. That is good to know that it's not dead. Um, okay. Uh, good to keep an eye out. And uh, all, all of you listening, if you if this is the first time you've ever heard of this, y- y'all should get, get on Red Rhino because it's it's legit. It's like Thanks. probably one of the most unique superhero stories out there currently. And I am very invested in learning Evangeline's detailed Mandalorian opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I have to know. Yeah, I mean, fair. She, I, fair uh yeah it's uh wherever you listen to podcasts it's all on across all the mediums so yeah Yeah. please check it out i'm very proud of it so everyone uh go check that out is there anything else you'd like to plug uh in the meantime you can follow me on all platforms at megfits89 uh i'm i'm not creative that's just it that's where i'm at everywhere uh yeah i'm and and keep an eye out there's some fun stuff coming up so all right good to know um in the meantime i have been callie hannah you can follow me at mega nerd 98 on the dying husk of twitter.com um for however long that remains up um and of course you can follow my writing here on fandom wire and be sure to follow uh at fandom wire on most if not all of the platforms i think i probably should do some level of research into what representation the website I work for has um but (laughs) um be sure to you know be sure to follow that for you know all your entertainment news and updates and what have you and thank you uh everybody for joining us and we will see you next time okay now where's the stop recording button (laughs) yeah okay there the most important part of the (laughs) recording is always the stop recording stop after start you receive an email notification when the cloud recording is ready yeah good i need that so i can send it to my editor